Hello, fellow teachers, and welcome to Teaching with Power. I'm Ben Wilcox, and I'm excited to spend some time in the scriptures with you today. Today we're going to be covering Doctrine and Covenants, sections 94 to 97. So grab your scriptures and your marking pencils. It's time to dig deep. I like to do the following icebreaker to introduce this section. And you know, you can tell a lot about what's important to the people of a certain city based on the kinds of buildings you find at their center. So let's see if that holds true. What would you say is important to the people of the following cities? So here we've got Washington, D.C. Well, based on the buildings, how about politics or government? How about the city of Manhattan in New York? Business or money? Let's go to another city here. Las Vegas. Gambling or sin. It's sin City, right? And then how about this next one? Oxford. And I'm going to say education is important to the people in that city. Now let's talk about another city. I currently live in, and I grew up in Salt Lake. And sometimes when people come to visit, they're a bit confused by the street system that we have here. It's the city where the streets have no names. Most are just numbers. So you have 13th East, 53rd South, 9th West. And people ask, how do you get around with just these numbers? And I tell them that it's actually uh, the easiest system to learn. Somebody who's never been to Salt Lake could drive directly to almost any location if they just understand the system. With just two coordinates, you can get almost anywhere. Now, here's how it works. There's a corner in downtown Salt Lake with this little stone pillar on it. And this is called the base meridian of the Salt Lake Valley. All the streets are measured from this point. So if I tell someone I want to meet them at 6th South and 9th East, that means they simply have to drive six blocks south of this point and nine blocks east of it. Based on the given address, they'll automatically know which quadrant of the city they're going to. And then they can just follow the street signs until they get to their destination. Give me two coordinates, and I can basically drive anywhere in the valley without ever having been there before. Now, that may, may be a bit of an oversimplification, but it seems to work here. Now, if you were visiting the Phoenix, Arizona area, and I tell you to meet me at Baseline and Val Vista, unless you're familiar with the area, or you're using GPS, you're not going to have any idea where to go you're going to have to pull out a map and try to find those roads or you're going to need to ask somebody for directions. So I like like the Salt Lake system. Now that's interesting, but what's more interesting is the location where you find that base meridian pillar. What building is right at that corner, exactly at the city center? It's the temple. All roads and addresses in the Salt Lake Valley are measured by their distance from the temple. It's at the center. I want you to open your scriptures to section 94 of the Doctrine and Covenants. This is a building revelation. The members of the church in Kirtland, Ohio, are being instructed to build three different buildings. And can you find what they are? In verse 1, 3, and 10. First, in verse 1, you have the temple. And that's key. The temple is where Zion begins. It says, Ye shall commence a work of laying out and preparing a beginning and foundation of the city of the stake of Zion here in the land of Kirtland, beginning at my house. The foundation of the city of the stake of Zion begins at his house, at the temple. Zion always starts at the temple. We saw that back in 84.4, where it said, Which city shall be built, 
beginning at the temple lot. So the saints build a temple in Kirtland, and they lay the cornerstones for a temple in Independence. And when they're pushed to far west, they lay the cornerstones for a temple there. They build a temple in Nauvoo. And when they arrive in the Salt Lake Valley, one of the first things Brigham Young is going to do is announce a location for the temple. Why? Because Zion begins at the temple. That's building number one. Building number two, in verse three, a house for the first presidency of the church in their work of obtaining revelations. And in verse 10, a house for the translation and printing of scriptures. Hmm, so so what does that suggest is important to members of the Church of Jesus Christ? What's at our center? The temple? We'd say the Lord and his will because the temple is his house or work for the dead or covenants or sealing. The revelations of the living prophets are central, and the scriptures are central to us. These are the original plans for the city of Far West in Missouri, the place that's later going to become the headquarters of the church after the saints are driven from Jackson County. And what do you see right in the middle there? It's it's the lot for the temple. That same idea is reflected in the Old Testament, uh, in the camp of the children of Israel, as they traveled through the wilderness. The tribes of Israel were arranged in a square around what central building? It was the tabernacle, which was, was their version of the temple. So what's the truth that section 94 is teaching us? The temple, the words of the living prophets, and the scriptures are central to the church. And to liken the scriptures here, I like to tell my students that what is true for cities of God is also true for the people of God. The city plan is an object lesson for our lives. And so we ask ourselves, what is at the center of my life? If your life was represented by a city plan, and in the middle of that city was a a giant statue or a building that represented what was most important to you, the thing that took precedence or priority over everything else, what would that building be? Or what would it be a statue of? Would it be a bank? A basketball or football stadium? Your office or the headquarters of your business? Would it be a movie theater? Or could it be a statue? A statue of your friends, uh, an Xbox, the opposite sex, a fancy car, or maybe even a 200-foot statue of yourself. Or maybe it could be a statue of a certain idea or ideal. Success, recognition, popularity, beauty, fun. Now, it's not that these buildings or statues have no place in our cities. They aren't always a matter of right and wrong. But are they at the center? Are they the standard by which all our decisions and priorities are based? Or is it the Lord and his gospel that's found there? The temple, the prophets, the scriptures. Are the cities of our lives more of a Salt Lake or a Las Vegas? How can we tell? We can tell what's at our center by examining which side takes precedence and priority when they're placed in conflict. For example, if we have to choose between sports and going to church, which comes first? If we have to choose between honesty and profit in our business, which comes first? If we have to choose between scripture study and playing video games, which comes first? If we have to choose between our political views and the counsels of the prophet, which comes first? The thing that is at our center will guide and inform all of those decisions. Now, by looking at section 94 as more than just a city plan 
but a life plan, you can gain even more insight. I want you to look in the following verses for instructions on building the cities of our lives. You can finish this sentence. I should build my life, dot, dot, dot. What could you fit there? From verses 2, 5 through 8, and verse 12. And here's what I found. According to verses 2, 5, 6, and 12, I should build my life after the pattern which is given unto me, the pattern given by the Lord. And where do we find the pattern? In the temple, the words of the living prophets, and in the scriptures. And according to verses 6, 7, and 12, I should build my life wholly dedicated unto the Lord. And according to verse 8, I should build my life in purity and not let any unclean thing into it. Because the promise is, if I'm clean, then the Lord's glory and presence will be there. And alike in the scriptures, what can I do to put the temple, the words of the prophets, and the scriptures more at the center of my life? How can I dedicate myself more wholly unto the Lord? And is there anything unclean in my city that I need to get rid of? I hope that this lesson has been somewhat of a reflective experience to get a bird's eye view of the city plan of our lives. I think it's a good question to often ask ourselves, what is at my center? And hopefully, we'll always find the things of God there. Sometimes we might need to bring in the wrecking ball of repentance and righteousness and demolish the buildings of sin and disobedience or tear down the statues of pride and greed that may have crept onto our skyline. Or maybe we'll just need to do some building relocations, move the football stadium down the street a little bit, or place our families closer to the center and the office a few more blocks away. Perhaps we need to place the statue of worldly success on the periphery of the city plan. And just like Salt Lake, If things are in their proper order, and we know the system, and we have the temple at the center, then we too should be easily able to arrive at our desired destination, which is hopefully eternal life. For sections 95 to 97, the focus continues to be on the temple. I'd call these the construction instruction sections. Each one deals with some aspect of the construction of temples in either Kirtland or Independence. So for an icebreaker to this section, I like to begin with a little bit of temple trivia. Now you can go through all of the questions first with your students and then correct them all together and see who got the most right. Or you could just go through them one by one and reveal the answers as you go. But let's see how you do here. In terms of square footage, What is the largest temple in the church? Washington, D.C., Anchorage, Alaska, Los Angeles, California, or Salt Lake City, Utah? And the answer is D. The Salt Lake Temple is the largest temple in the church by square footage. Now, in terms of square footage, what's the smallest temple in the world? Colonia Juarez, Chihuahua, Mexico, Monticello, Utah, Copenhagen, Denmark, or Suva, Fiji? And the answer is A, the temple in Chihuahua, which I think is easy to remember since Chihuahuas are small dogs. That's the smallest temple in the church. Now, what is the tallest temple? A, Salt Lake City, B, Oakland, California, C, Manhattan, New York, or D, Washington, D.C.? And the answer is D, Washington, D.C. Which general conference had the most new temples announced and named? A, October 1998, B, April 2021, C, October 2016, or D, April 2000? 
And the answer is B, April 2021. Our most recent general conference had the most temples announced and named than any other previous general conference. Now, there was a conference where Gordon B. Hinckley announced that there would be 30 new temples built, but those temples weren't named. So that's why we're saying it's B, uh, April 2021, with 20 temples. Number five, which prophet dedicated the most temples during his time as president? A, Heber J. Grant. B, Ezra Taft Benson. C, Gordon B. Hinckley or D, Thomas S. Monson? And the answer is C, Gordon B. Hinckley. Uh, during his tenure, he dedicated a lot of temples. Now, who knows? Maybe President Nelson will catch up with him. Number six, which was the first temple constructed outside of the United States? A, Bern, Switzerland. B, Epia, Samoa. C. Stockholm, Sweden, or D. Cardston, Canada? And the answer is D. Cardston, Canada. Uh, my hometown, the, the place where I was born. Number seven. Temples have been announced and constructed in all of the following countries except A. The United Arab Emirates, B. Poland, C. India, or D, China? And the answer is B, Poland. And that one just blows my mind. Uh, if you had told me uh, 10 years ago, even, that we were going to have a temple in the Middle East, or in India, or in China, I would have, I would have never believed it. It's amazing that we are going to have temples in each of those countries. Number eight, how many temples are currently in operation, under construction, or announced? A, 252, B, 212, C, 189, or D, 467? And the answer is A, 252. Ah, wonderful. Now that we've answered some general questions about our Latter-day Temples, let's go to the scriptures for some more specific questions about the house of the Lord. And you could approach it with this handout. The questions continue to be multiple choice, but then we're also going to add some open-ended, short answer discussion questions as well. So here we go. Number one, in 95.3, the saints are being chastened for not doing something. What is it? A, failing to live the law of consecration. B, neglecting to read the Book of Mormon. C, not starting to build the temple in Kirtland. Or D, not keeping the word of wisdom. Our answer is C, not starting to build the temple in Kirtland. Section 95 is a rebuke to the saints for failing to begin that task. The command to begin work on it had come about six months earlier in section 88. That revelation was received in December of 1832, and now it's June of 1833, and they still haven't started. And why do you think the Lord was unhappy about this? Well, knowing what we know about the temple, the saints are being deprived of those opportunities and blessings. He knows they need that power, that direction, and that help that the temple provides. Without it, his saints will not prosper. Remember that Zion begins at the temple. No temple, no Zion. Number two, in 95.4, the Lord mentions two purposes for the temple. What two words best summarize those purposes? A, preparation and spirit. B, commitment and strength. C, humility and kindness, or D, vicarious and ancestors? The answer is A, preparation and spirit. The Lord says that his house is for the preparation 
wherewith I design to prepare mine apostles to prune my vineyard for the last time. And he intends to pour out his spirit upon all flesh. The temple is a house of preparation and spirit. And how does the temple accomplish those two purposes? God prepares his servants there. I love that it's within the walls of the Salt Lake Temple that the First Presidency and the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles meet each week to discuss their plans for the church. I love that before missionaries go out to serve in the mission field, they are always endowed in the temple first. I love that church leaders who are seeking for guidance in making decisions for their wards or quorums or organizations are encouraged to pray and ponder within the temple for help. The temple prepares us all to do God's work. The Lord's also able to pour out his spirit upon us in the temple, which in turn allows us to go forth and pour that spirit out upon others, upon all flesh. The Lord doesn't only intend to bless those that worship within the walls of the temple with that spirit, but the entire communities and nations that surround his holy houses. We enter the walls of the temple with our empty pitchers, which are then filled with the Spirit. We can then take those pitchers and pour that Spirit out upon our neighbors and co-workers and friends. Number three, in 95.8, the Lord promised to do what for the saints if they built a temple? A, strengthen their marriages and families. B, endow them with power. C, protect them from their enemies. Or D, bring them happiness. Now, I believe the temple does each of those things for us, but only one of them is mentioned in verse 8. The answer is B. The Lord says he wants them to build his house. In the which house I design to endow those whom I have chosen with power from on high. Now, that's probably referring to the priesthood power that's going to be restored through Elijah, Elias, and Moses once the Kirtland Temple is complete. But I believe it can also reference the personal power that we receive when we're found worthy of the temple and worship in it. And how does the Lord do this for us in the temple? Well, they call one of the special ordinances we perform in the temple the endowment. And what's an endowment? It's actually a financial term. It's a special kind of gift or donation. If I were to establish an endowment for my children, I would set aside a certain amount of money in an investment fund. My children would not be able to touch that initial donation. But they would have access to any of the interest that that investment created. In that way, my gift could last and bless them forever as opposed to just handing over a lump sum of money all at once. That's what the temple endowment is like. It's a gift that keeps on giving. Every time we worship in the temple, the Lord endows us with more knowledge, with more power. Power to act, power to endure, power to understand. Well, number four. What specifically were the brethren not to do in building the temple, according to 95 verses 13 through 14? A, they were not to build it after the manner of the world. B, they were not to build it out of logs. C, they were not to build it for another six months. Or D, they were not to build it in the winter. The answer is A, they were not to build it after the manner of the world. This was a different kind of building and thus required a different kind of blueprint. And now our discussion question. Why do you think the Lord instructed them not to do that? And the answer is right there in verse 13. Let the house be built not after the manner of the world, for I give not unto you that ye shall live after the manner of the world. Maybe you've noticed something about our temples. If you look at the architecture, you'll notice that they are unique from all other buildings, even our own churches. They look different. They stand out. Latter-day temples have their own distinct style. And there's a lesson in that. The temple is symbolic in everything, even the architecture. 
temple architecture reminds us that we are to be different from the world. We don't build our lives after the manner of the world, but after the manner of the Lord. And in my interviews with the youth of my ward, I often remind them that they are not meant to be or act like average teenagers. They're teenagers of the Church of Jesus Christ. Husbands and wives and parents are not meant to be your average husbands and wives and parents, but husbands and wives and parents of the Church of Jesus Christ. We don't do things like the rest of the world. We look different. We speak different. We act different. We don't excuse ourselves by saying things like, but that's what everybody else is doing. We're not afraid to stand up and stand out. You'll notice that many of our temples are built on hills or next to major highways. They're often constructed in brightly colored exteriors, And they're all lit up at night. They're beautiful and clean and constructed of the finest materials. That's a message of the way in which we should live. We are to be a light to the world. An example. People should be able to look to us as inspiration and exemplary of a Christ-like lifestyle. Every time I pass by one of our temples, I like to reflect on that truth. Am I like the temple? Does my worthiness and way of life emanate that same beauty and purity and godliness? That beauty and purity and godliness comes from building our lives after the manner which God has shown unto us. In the case of the Kirtland Temple, the Lord revealed the plans for its construction in a miraculous way. The church was very poor at this point, and as the brethren discussed building a temple, some suggested that they build it out of logs. And Joseph's response was, And shall we, brethren, build a house for our God of logs? No, brethren, I have a better plan than that. I have the plan of the house of the Lord given by himself. And how did he get that plan? Joseph received the word of the Lord for him to take his two counselors, Williams and Rigdon, and come before the Lord, and he would show them the plan or model of the house to be built. We went upon our knees, called on the Lord, and the building appeared within viewing distance. I being the first to discover it, then all of us viewed it together. After we had taken a good look at the exterior, the building seemed to come right over us, and the makeup of this hall seems to coincide with what I there saw to a minutia. And how cool is that? They were able to see it like it was a 3D visualization of the final plan, God's version of a hologram. He showed them how to build the temple. He gave them the design. When it comes to our lives, the Lord does the same kind of thing. He's revealed special godly plans for us to follow. We don't need to follow the plans of the world to become something. We don't need to measure ourselves by Babylonian standards. We're building temples, not log cabins. And we can only construct those glorious buildings when we trust in the Lord's plans rather than our own blueprints or the blueprints of the world. Number five. In 95.16, what purpose for the temple is described here? A, it's a place to study the scriptures more deeply. B, it's a place to find protection from the world. C, it's a place to repent and ask for forgiveness. Or D, it's a place to pray and offer up our desires to God. The answer is D. It's a place to pray and offer up our desires to God. And why is the temple a perfect place to do this? It's not that we can't pray and connect with God in the same way in our homes or churches or other places. But the temple is a special place to do that. My favorite place to pray in the world is within the walls of the celestial room. There's just something a little bit different about praying there. There have been a lot of times in my life where I felt I needed that additional closeness to God, that additional clarity and sense of holiness surrounding me to open my mind and heart to the guidance of the Spirit. The temple provides us with just such an environment. So if you feel like you're struggling to connect with heaven in your normal day-to-day, Try praying in the temple. 
It may just make the difference that you need. Number six, in 96 verses 1 through 2, what blessing of the temple is suggested here? A, light. B, strength. C, faith. Or D, knowledge. The answer is B, strength. The Lord says that it's expedient that Zion be made strong. Therefore, he's going to place Newell K. Whitney in charge of the temple property to help make that possible. And how does the temple give us this? I don't know about you, but I always feel stronger after I leave the temple. I have more resolve to do what's right, to be a better husband and father, and to serve more faithfully in my calling. When I attend the temple with my wife or my children, I feel our relationship becomes stronger. I feel stronger in the face of temptation because I see things more clearly. My perspective has been lifted to a more heavenly plane. Being surrounded by all that cleanness and purity and order and peace and love is enough to make you feel stronger than all the armies of the adversary. Number seven, in 97.13, what two purposes of the temple do you find in this verse? A, inspiration and reverence. B, priesthood and missionary work. C, gratitude and knowledge. Or D, justice and mercy. The answer is C, gratitude and knowledge. We learn that the temple is for a place of thanksgiving for all saints and for a place of instruction for all those who are called to the work of the ministry in all their several callings and offices. And how does the temple fulfill these purposes? The temple is a house of thanksgiving in that it's a place where we can offer gratitude. We can feel gratitude for the fact that he's given us such a beautiful place to worship. We can feel gratitude for the opportunity we have to bring the blessings of the gospel to our ancestors. We can feel gratitude for the relationships that are made eternal within the walls of the temple. We can feel gratitude for the lives the gospel allows us to live. As a people, we have been given much. An ideal place to express that gratitude is in the house of the very being who has given it all to us. The temple is also a house of instruction. And that idea is further elaborated on in verse 14. That they may be perfected in the understanding of their ministry, in theory, in principle, and in doctrine, in all things pertaining to the kingdom of God on the earth, the keys of which kingdom have been conferred upon me. So the temple is also a kind of school. Our understanding is perfected there. There are things that we learn in the temple that we don't discuss anywhere else. We learn sacred truths there. Everything can teach us in the temple. So when you go, assume that everything you see and do is symbolic. The architecture, the clothing, the words that are said, the order in which things are done, the actions and movements that we make, all should be considered symbolic and instructional. And that's what I love about the temple. The ceremonies are so deep and, and so symbolic that they can teach you new things every time you go. And we're going to develop that idea a little bit more when we get to section 109. So what truth has our study taught us? It's taught us that the temple is a place of preparation, spirit, power, prayer, strength, thanksgiving, and instruction. So like in the scriptures, have you ever felt like the temple has served one of these purposes in your life? When and how? Well, when you look at that list and consider all the incredible things that the temple does for us, can you see why the Lord was so adamant that they get to work on building the temple right away? Maybe we can understand why he chastises them so sorely and calls their delay a very grievous sin in 95 verse 3. They had gone six more months without access to those blessings. And in 95 6, he compares that to walking in darkness at noonday. 
do we ever make the same mistake? Are there times when we've allowed ourselves to go months and months without worshiping within the walls of the temple? When those great blessings are sitting right there, do we just drive by or let the worries and busyness of the world get in the way? I can see three temples from my bathroom window. How sad would it be for me to have that kind of opportunity and go months and months without visiting one? It would be like walking in darkness at noonday. I know that not all saints have that kind of access and blessing. But over the last three decades, our church leaders have worked tirelessly to put temples within close reach of almost every member of the church throughout the world. I don't know what the exact statistic is, but I can imagine that over 80% of the members of the church live within an hour or two of a temple. If you look at a map of all the temples either built or announced throughout the world, it's absolutely amazing. Dots everywhere even on many of those little islands of the sea out in the middle of the ocean. God wants all of his children to experience these blessings. And so I hope that this can maybe serve as a bit of a wake-up call for us not to delay the blessings of the temple. And we don't even personally have to build them. We just need to go. Those promised blessings will be ours if we just make the time to get there. I had a bit of a quicker activity that you can do here in section 97. It's been a while since we've done a crossword puzzle, so you could use this handout to briefly cover some of the principles that are found in this section. I'd introduce it by challenging my students to find the true definition of Zion. Zion is so much more than a place, than a physical location. What is it? The answer is in verse 21. For this is Zion, the pure in heart. That was perhaps the Lord's way of reminding the saints in independence that Zion was to be built in their hearts, not just with their hands. You can't have Zion the place without first having Zion the people. So section 97 is going to help us to understand some of the qualities that a Zion people possess. So here we go. A Zion people number five across, they have contrite spirits. Six across, they seek diligently to learn wisdom and to find truth. Seven across, they are truly humble. And nine across, I, the Lord, show mercy unto all the meek. Now for the down clues. They should yield good fruit. Two down. They are willing to observe their covenants by sacrifice. Three down. A Zion people are pure in heart. Four down. They have honest hearts. And eight down. They also have broken hearts. And as a teacher... You could discuss with your students why these attitudes are important and encourage them to apply them in their own lives. Well, one final thought. I want to take a quick look at the first two verses of section 95. For an icebreaker, you can invite your students to share a personal experience. You can ask, what's the most trouble you've ever gotten into with your parents? And how did they react? So for me, when I was younger, we lived in a neighborhood where lots of new houses were going up under construction. And as a boy, playing around in these unfinished homes was really exciting. We'd sneak in when all the construction workers were gone, and we'd run around the rooms and play hide-and-seek and look at all the cool tools and construction materials. That went on for a while until my parents found out, and they strictly forbade me to do it anymore. They said it was dangerous, that it was trespassing, that we could easily get hurt or run into somebody that wasn't really nice. And so I promised them that I wouldn't do it again. Well, a short time later, my friend told me that there was a really cool house just down the street that had just gone up and that we should go check it out. But I told him firmly that my parents had told me not to do that anymore and that I couldn't go. 
And then he said, but there's a spiral staircase in it. And I said, okay, let's go. And we went and I was playing and exploring in that house and having a grand old time when at one point I decided to crawl up out of a window well from the basement into the front yard. And as my luck would have it, who just happened to be passing by walking the dog at that exact moment? It was my dad. And our eyes locked. And I could see the disappointment and the frustration in his eyes. And he said, Ben, go home and we'll talk about this. And that was a very long walk home. And there I had to face my mom and dad who were so disappointed in my disobedience. I received a strong rebuke, and I think I was grounded from playing with my friends for the next couple of weeks. Well, in section 95, the Lord's going to get after the members of the church a little for their disobedience. He's going to chasten them. And to chasten means to rebuke, to discipline, or to punish. Being rebuked, disciplined, or punished is usually not a very pleasant experience for the person at the receiving end of the chastisement. And when that happens, it's easy for that person to develop negative feelings towards the person doing the rebuking, or to feel that the rebuker looks down on them or, or, or hates them even. Now I want you to read verses 1 and 2 to learn something about the motivation behind most chastisement, especially when it comes from the Lord. What is the motivation behind chastisement? It's love. Verily thus saith the Lord unto you whom I love, and whom I love I also chasten, that their sins may be forgiven. For with the chastisement I prepare a way for their deliverance in all things out of temptation, and I have loved you. Wherefore ye must needs be chastened and stand rebuked before my face. The Lord chastens out of love. And look how many times the Lord says that he loves them in that verse. Three times. It's even how he begins it. Thus saith the Lord unto whom I love. Well, how is chastisement a form of love? The Lord gives them a couple of reasons in verse 1. So that their sins can be forgiven and to deliver them out of temptation. The Lord is hoping that his rebuke will help turn their hearts back to God to seek forgiveness. It also gives them added motivation not to sin again. Chastisement helps us to know where we've gone wrong and, and can help prepare us to do what's right in the future. When our judgment is lacking, somebody with more experience can help us to see the danger and error of our ways. I know we've probably all heard our parents at some point say, I'm only doing this for your own good. And we have these rules and these consequences because we care about you. And as a youth, I didn't always believe that. Now, as a parent, I know for a fact that that's true. It's sometimes easy to doubt that goodwill when somebody is chewing us out. But it is there. Honestly, the very act of chastisement and rebuke demonstrates concern. Now, we're not talking about uncontrolled anger or domineering or abuse here. It is possible for chastisement to cross a line. But if a parent didn't care about their child, how would they react when they saw them making foolish or dangerous choices? They would say, I don't care what you do. I don't care if you get hurt. I don't care what consequences you might suffer. Engagement and discipline show love. Lack of response and disengagement shows indifference. God's not indifferent to us. Therefore, the truth, God chastens those he loves. Now to the other side of that equation, how should we react when we're chastened? Do we shake our fist at the heavens? Do we go to our room and slam the door? Do we yell and argue and fight back? Do we rationalize and make excuses? The brethren of the church are a great example of the proper reaction to chastisement after this revelation was received. They got the message, especially Hiram. Immediately, he goes out, grabs a scythe, and starts clearing the land at the temple lot. 
Some of the other brethren join him. And later that day, he begins to dig a trench for the foundation. So they didn't fight back. They didn't get upset. They didn't accuse God of hating them and trying to make their lives miserable. They accepted the rebuke in the spirit in which it was given. Love and concern. And then they acted on it. And then we can do the same thing. So a question to ponder. Have you ever felt chastened by the Lord or by life? And I think it's important for us to understand how that chastisement often comes. It can come from church leaders and parents and friends, but it can also come through the influence of the Holy Ghost. Are we in tune enough with the Spirit to hear when the Lord has correction for us? Those rebukes will often come to us in our minds and hearts. And I know that there have been many times in my life where I've been listening to general conference or listening to a lesson or a talk in church or studying my scriptures, and I felt the Spirit whisper to me, you need to do better at that. You're failing in this or that area. It's time to improve in that thing. And how do we react when those moments come? Do we ignore the voice? Do we start rationalizing and making excuses? Do we get angry? Do we get discouraged? Or are we more like Hiram? Do we stand up and get to work? I hope that we'll be like that and accept the Lord's rebukes of love. When I teach teenagers, I often like to throw in this additional application since they often wonder why their parents are hard on them sometimes. I like to remind them that they often just don't understand the position their parents are in. I tell them I'm going to let them in on a little secret. Adults are really just children too. We are learning also. This is the first time that they've ever been parents, and I'm willing to bet that most of their parents truly love them and want what's best for them. But sometimes they just don't know the best way to raise them. Inwardly, they're pleading for God to help them to know what to do. So the next time you find yourself poised for an argument, try cutting your parents a little slack. And then I, I like to offer my students this little challenge. I say, the next time you're chastised by mom or dad, please realize where they're coming from. And instead of getting angry and huffing and puffing away and slamming the door, try this. Look at them and say, I don't agree with you, mom or dad, but I know the only reason you're acting this way is because you love me and want what's best for me. And I'm willing to accept any consequence that you decide on. And then just wait to see what their reaction is. After they've picked their jaws up off the floor, you may be surprised what comes next. As a possible added benefit, perhaps the consequences won't be as severe. Perhaps we can do the same kind of thing with the Lord, too. When we're facing the consequences of our bad choices, instead of shaking our fists at the sky and asking, why me? We can accept his chastisement and ask ourselves, what am I supposed to learn from this? And remember the motive of that correction. Love. Well, thank you for joining me today. It's a bit of a shorter week. I hope it's been meaningful to you. And really the best thing that you could do if you found this material helpful is to share it with somebody that you feel it could help. If you'd like access to any of the teaching resources that are associated with this lesson, go to teachingwithpower.com and you'll find all the links that you need. Thank you so much for watching. Now get out there and teach with power.